Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to the first talk in the geology lecture series at Southwest Oregon Community College this year. And we've got a great uh, lineup this evening and into the future. Should you have an electronic device, if you would be so kind as to turn it off at present, I would appreciate it. Also, if you didn't sign one of these great sign-in sheets, uh, I'd appreciate if you'd put at least some information, like name, where you're from, and date, date of birth, even just the year. Uh, the date of the birth for some of you, I do send uh, random uh, birthday cards, just once, once in a while I pull it out. <laughs> a few of you might even be in that list. Actually, my wife usually probably ends up writing them. Uh, but you have this list, and it actually helps justify things. So for instance, our third talk this year is Dr. Gavin Hayes from the USGS. Uh, all of you now go, <gasps> because he works for the USGS, which is currently shut down. So I'm assuming that by mid-January that he'll be here. Uh, he's going to be talking about mitigating disasters in the 21st century that are associated with earthquakes, so something that is certainly timely globally and hopefully not in the not too uh, distant future locally. We'll hopefully push that off for, for quite some time. Also, you'll note that out on the tables, there's some posters for the November talk by a good friend of mine, Pat Pringle, coming down from Centralia to talk about ghost forests. So all of those things are coming up in the future. The College Foundation and the college uh, are significant sponsors of this event. Uh, the guys up in the booth that are live streaming and archiving this talk and uh, doing the tech for this evening so that things work, uh, certainly a huge help. Uh, we also have uh, all of you to thank because last year we raised over $1,500 uh, from donations. If you're interested and can, love to have you help support. If you can't, it was always my goal to have this be a free community event. So uh, if you've got the wherewithal and would like to put a couple bucks in afterwards, that'll be there. Uh, you can also write a check to the SWAC Foundation as well, uh, 501c3 nonprofit. Uh, be sure to put Geo Lecture Series in the tagline though. That would be greatly appreciated. Also this evening, sponsor-wise, it really pleases me for the second year uh, to team up with Oregon Institute of Marine Biology. And so this fall, uh, we're linked up with their uh, fall public lecture. So this one is even more, I think, in tune with crossover between what we do in the community college and what they do out in Charleston, uh, both topic-wise and also in a lot of ways background-wise. Uh, Deb was very gracious in coming in this afternoon, uh, and we've basically had her bouncing back and forth between Charleston uh, at OIMB and the college a little bit the last uh, day and a half or two. And she came in this afternoon and talked to a group of college, uh, community college as well as high school students. And it's nice to know that she started her career um, academically at a community college, and I think it also helped a lot of our students realize that as a junior, she really didn't have a plan of where exactly she was gonna, gonna go, and at that point hadn't taken any geology, oceanography, or the like. Uh, went on, got her bachelor's degree, uh, obviously has continued. She did some academic work at UW, uh, and then also on the East Coast in Halifax, Nova Scotia, and has been on the staff, uh, faculty of the University of Washington for some time now. It's my sincere pleasure to introduce to you this evening, Dr. Deborah Kelly. Hello, great. Well, it's my distinct pleasure to be here today. I, I had a great visit yesterday and today. Um, it was really wonderful talking with the community and the students much, much enjoyed it. Um, yeah, I did have a very diverse background starting as a music major. And I don't think you can do this anymore, but I graduated as an undergrad with 300 credits, which might give you some indication of uh, a longer path than most people. Uh, so I've, uh, what I want to share with you today is um, some of the connections between underwater volcanism and life. Uh, most of the work we do now, actually, when I, I'll share with you a large project I'm involved in, but it's actually most of it, even though I'm at the UW, we do most of our studies now off uh, the Oregon coast at a methane seep site 
and then uh, this large volcano, which I'll share with you today. Um, so uh, when I first started out in geology uh, and went out on ships, uh, it was all geology. At that time, we didn't even know where the underwater mountains were. Um, it's really fundamentally changed since then, obviously. But now I don't think we ever go out on a cruise without geologists, chemists, engineers, um, biologists. So it's much more interdisciplinary program. And uh, what I want to share with you tonight is some of those linkages between underwater volcanism and the amazing uh, life forms that we have here. Um, I also wanted to mention that Craig Young, who's uh, at the biology station, I'll be a little bit embarrassed to show some of the biology slides because as a geologist, uh, it might be interesting interpretation, but he's a world expert in the vent communities and has done a lot of the really uh, amazing work in those sites. So if you can uh, correct me if I screw up. Um, so, um, you know, even most people don't know that, many people don't know that 70% of the world's volcanism occurs on the planet and occurs underwater, and it's because it's out of our, our field of view. Um, and along where we work along the Mid-Ocean Ridge Spreading Centers, which were the, the plates are spreading apart, I'll show you a cross-section of that a cartoon in a minute, um, it's really the longest under mountain, underwater mountain chain uh, on the globe, and so it's a very prominent feature. Um, there's 70% of the world's ocean. The planet is covered by water, and, and this is a major, major building block. It really fundamentally, these mid-ocean ridge systems, really fundamentally govern the, the face of our planet, and yet because it's underwater, it's hard to uh, get access to. We're just getting the right kind of technologies to gain insights in this, this new world. Um, we're starting to have a, a new vision of how these systems work, um, and they're, they're incredible. So there's hundreds of thousands of, from satellite mapping mostly, uh, there's hundreds of thousands of underwater volcanoes. Uh, you've probably heard that the face of Mars is mapped in more detail than our own oceans, and that's, that's completely true. There's maybe less than one, certainly less than 10 percent of the mid-ocean ridges where I work that's been mapped in enough detail to do the kind of really detailed studies that we have. So it's one of the themes that I'll try and share with you is um, the oceans are really ripe for really profound, very profound discoveries. Um, and especially as young people, I was challenged growing up thinking, um, you know, how are discoveries ever going to be made there, there by people way brighter than I am. And yet what you'll see is that there, there's amazing opportunities now. So I really encourage students that um, there's a lot out there still to do. And part of that is we've only, because of mostly technology, uh, uh, we've been hampered by technology. We're never in the right place at the right time to see these underwater volcanoes. So even though we've known about them for decades, to this date, today, there's only about two or three that have ever been actually witnessed, uh, except for places like Iceland or Hawaii. Um, we haven't had the vehicles in the right place to see these eruptions, and I'll, I'll show you some of that imagery. The other thing is that um, more and more, I'll show you some hot spring systems, and those are metal sulfide deposits, basically. Um, and they're becoming more and more of interest for resources throughout the world as we get more, uh, it's harder to get metals out of the ground. We're using up a lot of the resources. And so countries like Japan, down in Papua New Guinea, they're actually looking at these underwater volcanoes where the boiling vents are. Turns out boiling increases the metals in systems. And so they're actually starting to mine these underwater volcanoes. And so there's a, a big push to have some of these volcanoes uh, as reserves because you can imagine what the mining does to these underwater communities. And then finally, um, the hot spring systems, and it's what Craig's an expert at, um, they, they still amaze me. I, if I could come back, I might come back as a biologist because they are just unbelievably beautiful and uh, we know very little in some levels about the kind of animals, particularly in the microbial world, that live there. So today what I'll try and do tonight is just give you an overview of some of the the beauty of this place and give you access to places you may not have seen before. So you've probably seen this, but um, if you stripped off all the ocean water, that red line that wraps around the globe like a seam on a baseball is where the youngest, hottest rocks are. So if you could dive down there, you'd see underwater eruptions not as violent usually as Hawaii or Iceland, but again, we're, we're never there. Um, but you can see that they're a fundamental part of the planet. And if you were lucky enough to go to Iceland and look at a spreading center where these tectonic plates are spreading apart, this is what you see is one side is the Eurasia plate and one, 
one side is uh, North America plate, and it's this rift zone uh, where the plates are physically spreading apart and where there's upwelling magma from beneath the sea floor. So this is just a, a cartoon here. Um, so there's very large convection cells that set up uh, beneath the spreading centers, and they, they drive the plates up across there. And we're going to zoom in on where I work is this little tiny kind of almost pimple on this very large scale planetary process that's going on. And so if we zoom into that little box, um, the beneath the sea floor at depths of, oh, maybe a mile to maybe three miles or so, uh, there's holding tanks of melt, uh, just like the same type of melt almost that you'd see in Hawaii or Iceland. And those holding tanks we call magma chambers. And that melt is over 2,000 degrees Fahrenheit. And that every once in a while, that magma chamber, that holding tank, as more and more melt gets, uh, migrates up into the holding tank, it gets overpressurized. And it cracks the rocks above it. And there's large pipes that end up taking the lava from the deep sea, beneath the sea floor, out onto the sea floor, forming these large underwater eruptions. Um, And so uh, one of the uh, most amazing sights is when you're diving in the submarine or with a robotic vehicle. Um, most of the seafloor looks at, if it's not covered by sediment, uh, around these spreading axes, these are pillow basalts. They come out at um, pretty slow effusion rates, kind of bulbous, similar to like if you squished a toothpaste tube. Um, but if you looked at them in close, what you'd see is they're completely covered in glass. So you get these 2,000 degree uh, lava that comes out on the seafloor. The seawater we rework is about oh, 34 degrees Fahrenheit, and it quenches. And so all these rocks are, if they're fresh, they're covered in glass. Um, a lot of animals down there, which I'll share. And then these are one of my favorite features. So you can imagine a very large lava lake, the pond, a big pond of melt on the seafloor that gets crusted over quite rapidly. And then as the melt drains back, you can see these. Uh, they look like bathtub rings. As the melt drains back, there becomes a large void under the sea floor, and the whole roof collapses in. And there, they form these beautiful pillars and collapse zones. And I'll show you some some video of that in a little bit. But they're really amazing, amazing features, and be, can be quite large. So um, you might have seen some of this video. This is from uh, West Mana Volcano. This is the very first, uh, except for Hawaii. Um, this was the very first. Uh, arc volcano that had ever been observed during an eruption, and this was taken with the um, robotic vehicle, uh, unmanned vehicle called Jason. And you can see one of the great things about having a, a lot of water on top of the volcanoes is they are not as explosive usually as uh, ones on land on terrestrial systems. So you can get very close to an underwater erupting volcano with a robotic vehicle. Um, and get some really beautiful images and, and samples. So they were actually able to get gas samples of this erupting volcano. But again, we've never, except for a couple times, even though there's probably eruptions going off every single day in these spreading centers, we're almost never there at the right time. And so one of the things that I study, I've uh, been studying for the last 20, 30 years or so, is these hot spring systems. So. What happens is um, the, you can imagine, you can think of it as if you're setting a cold pot of water on your stove and then turn the burner on. So, and the fluids start convecting. As they get hotter and hotter, they get buoyant. The fluids rise, the hot fluid rises to the top and it sucks in the cooler seawater or cooler water on the stove. And the same thing happens in the ocean crust, except this is depth of, say, a mile down or so. So you have this hot holding tank that's over 2,000 degrees and hot rock on top of that. And the, at the spreading centers, the, as the crust spreads, it gets cooler, cracks. You get very, very large fractures and fissures in the rocks. And cold seawater migrates down into the crust and then gets heated up. And it sets up these large convection cells. And as it does that, it leaches out. These fluids become very acidic. And it leaches out most of the metals in the rocks. And one of the main reasons that underwater volcanoes explode is they have a lot of carbon, they have other gases, but a lot of the gas is CO2. So there's hydrogen, hydrogen sulfide, carbon dioxide. And as the cold seawater migrates, gets hotter and hotter, it leaches the metals out, but it also entrains a lot of the magmatic gases. And then by the time it's down in near this um, very, very hot portion, it's over 700 degrees Fahrenheit. 
It rushes up in these jets. I'll show you some video in a second. These, they look like um, a fire hose on the seafloor. And we call them black smokers. All that material is fine grain metal sulfide. And then it forms sometimes very, very large chimneys. So if you dug into this chimney, it's all, all rock. Um, and a lot of it is fool's gold, so there's zinc and copper. And, and this is what people are interested in mining. But it also, you can see, hosts amazing, amazing animals. So they call them these black smokers. This is the fine-grained, uh, very particulate-rich metal sulfides. And then this is the massive structure. These things get up to the largest one we found actually off uh, in the world still. Uh, we found off of Vancouver Island on a place called Endeavor Segment. And these chimneys reached 150 feet tall and almost as wide. So they can be quite large. Um, we went out there in 19, so we'd been out there many, many times. We went out there in 1996. And even then, we didn't have great navigation, but it's hard to miss a 150-foot tree in the forest. Um, and it was gone. And we were like, what? How they? And it, the whole thing had fallen over, so it was this very large rubble pile. Uh, and we went back that year and it had already grown 30 feet. So there's, these things are incredibly dynamic uh, systems. And this is, um, this is what Craig studies. So this is uh, one of the, I think, really amazing features for me is that even though the chemistry of these vent fluids, so they're very metal rich, they're very rich in dissolved magmatic gases, um, and they have different kinds of acidity, uh, that they, even the animals in the Atlantic at these vent sites, even though the fluid chemistry, the geology is pretty much the same, are very different than the animals on the Pacific site. And so this is about uh, 7,000 feet down. And what you're looking at, this is the black smoker, so the metal sulfide material. And these are millions and millions of shrimp that live down there associated with uh, the vent environment. So in the Atlantic, we see uh, these are mussels and shrimp. And those are very, very characteristic of the um, Atlantic sites. You can see there's a few crabs. This is a, a place where there was a, a relatively recent eruption, but you can see that um, the dominant, many of the dominant animals here are, are these beautiful mussels, and, and uh, in this case, you don't see the shrimp in this. So then if we go into the Pacific here, uh, this is off of, in the Galapagos, on the Galapagos Rift, these are large tube worms. I think they get up to about six feet tall. Um, they have these beautiful red gills, and they, they grow, in, they grow in, the, in the Pacific here, off our coast, they also grow on the sulfide deposits. But you can see there's very few shrimp, um, and they're dominated by these large tube worms. And so between the Pacific and the Atlantic, there are much many, many different biological communities. And so there's a lot of interest in looking at the biogeography and why animals in one part of the world are different than the other. And it could be that places like Iceland act as large, which is just directly on the spreading center, act as large topographic barriers for flow of of larvae and transport along the, the spreading center. So there's a lot of really amazing science still to be done in these, in these vent environments. Um, so about, oh, this is probably early, early 90s, something in that way, um, people started recognizing that there was a lot of uh, biological micro, microorganisms associated with these vent environments. Um, and in 1993, uh, so there used to be, a, it's still out there, an array called the SOSIS array, which was a set of hydrophones uh, that was um, put out after the Cold War to look for submarines coming into places where we didn't want them. And uh, it turns out in 1993, uh, for the very first time, uh, and all those data were classified, they let a scientist at NOAA here in Oregon um, have access to those data. And it turns out that the, the hydrophones not only pick up submarines, but they also pick up earthquakes that we would never pick up on land. And I think it was about two weeks after the, they let um, this guy's name is Bob Ziak have access to those data uh, off our coast on the volcano that I'm going to take you to, just a little bit north of there, there were thousands and thousands of earthquakes, small, like one magnitude. And they, over three days, they migrated 50 kilometers along the axis in an almost straight line. And we were lucky enough to go out there about three months later. I'm going to back this up because I want to show you the video again. About three months later with a robotic vehicle. And um, this was a large hole in the sea floor right here, about this big. And there was warm, about uh, maybe not quite 200 degree Fahrenheit fluid coming out of that. And all that white material is microbial, either it's microbes, so single-celled small organisms, or it's uh, material produced by these microbes. 
And so um, what started happening around this time was this incredibly revolutionary idea that the, these, there's obviously no sunlight down there. So when they first found the vents, one of the major discoveries was that these microbes live in the absence of sunlight and they basically can, they thrive off of almost everything that would kill us. So carbon dioxide, hydrogen sulfide, uh, they can process mercury, they can process uh, uranium. Uh, there's a lot of interest in bioremediation. Um, but when they started, we started fighting these volcanoes uh, and these things, we call them snowblowers, and I'll show you some better imagery now. Um, the hypothesis was that to some depth beneath the sea floor, where we have warm circulating fluids, and during an eruption, a lot of carbon dioxide, that there's these under subsea floor blooms of microorganisms. And this, this is a major process that happens during and after a volcanic eruption which no one had ever seen. Um, they'd seen one event in 1991 at um, the East Pacific Rise, uh, and then this is again at Axial. So the idea was that within the subsurface, there's this potentially incredibly vast microbial community that we probably only have cultured maybe 1% that's there. And even looking at these microbes now, it's redefined what a species is. You can't use the normal techniques people look at to define these species. So the potential is that there's this unbelievably phenomenal, diverse, and large community of organisms that live in the subsurface and on the surface too, and we know almost nothing about them. And it may have a lot of implications for society. So uh, a friend of mine who's a mi microbiologist suggested that, um, he indicated that when you bring these, we can take these pieces of sulfide chimneys and uh, bring them up, crush them, put them in a test tube, and grow them at different pressures and temperatures and stress the organisms out. And some of these organisms produce different kind of antibodies when you stress them out. So some of the pharmaceutical companies are quite interested now in um, biomedical applications as our bodies get more and more uh, resistant to things like penicillin or tetracycline that maybe some of these microbes from the deep can be used for, um, for biomedical pur uh, purposes. Uh, so that's one application. The other thing is these organisms, um, they actually precipitate out metal sulfides, and so the mining communities have used similar organisms to clean out, if they have slag heaps of the waste deposits, it's very hard to clean out some of those toxic metals, and these organisms actually help precipitate out the metal. So there's a lot of interest in societal applications to these things. Um, and then I mentioned before that um, they are, uh, if you go out, like you used to go out and stake out a mine, a lot of the countries now are staking out claim to the sea floor to stake it out for the microorganisms. So it's a, it's a pretty interesting, and in the future, I think it's going to be a really fundamental place for new discoveries. So there's a lot of reasons. One is just excitement of looking at a new place no one's ever seen before. The other is, um, you know, just the whole discovery process. But then the potential that as we get better and better techniques, we may f make some really important discoveries that are highly beneficial to society. Uh, so since 1979, when the first black smoker was found, um, there's over 300 of these venting sites now uh, around the world. And you'll notice that there's um, kind of a dearth of uh, discoveries down in, particularly in the, the southern sites, and if you went to the north, you'd see that also. And that's because this is a, it's a nasty place to work. Um, when it's blowing 60, or you guys would know when it's blowing 60 or 80, uh, you don't get a lot of work done on a boat, and so, and it also takes, uh, usually, if you're, depending on where you're working, it can take 10 days by a ship to get to those work sites, so it's a, it's certainly there are hydrothermal vents down there, and we know there are, but it's um, a, a largely unexplored area. So the way that we um, work on the seafloor is fundamentally changed. Um, I don't know how you could have forced me into something like that, but in 1935, uh, they went in there and were basically nailed inside. Um, but they didn't even have any cameras, so a lot of our early images of the deep sea were these really phenomenally amazing, beautiful illustrations that people had done. Luckily for us, uh, for me anyway, since that time, uh, we now have access to a variety of vehicles uh, that get us down, in this case, Alvin. It's the old Alvin, it's now sleeping. Um, but, uh, so Alvin is really the workhorse for the scientific community in the U.S. Anyone can apply to write a grant uh, application to use a vehicle. Um, I'll show you what it looks like on the inside. Uh, so it goes down about 4,000 meters. Um, it has two front arms that are uh, manipulators. They're hydraulic, force, some of them are force feedback, so you can 
uh, go down there and the pilots can actually tell if they're gripping something too hard, to, especially important for animals because you don't want to squish them. Um, and it carries, uh, there's a front window, which is what the pilot looks out of. And then there's two side windows, one over there, one over there. The windows are about this big around. Um, they, you get in the sub usually at around 7.30, 8 in the morning. Uh, where we work off our coast at 7,000 feet, it's about an hour, hour and a half down. Um, and then you come up, depending, it all runs, so this is completely free swimming. It has marine batteries that it drives around on. And usually around 4 o'clock in the afternoon, uh, you come up from the dive. I mean, it's a very safe vehicle. There's only been a few episodes. Uh, but as I, I mentioned, um, so it's, I think I, it's way over 3,000 dives. I think it's closer to 5,000 dives now. Uh, this, was, this vehicle was 30 years old. Um, and so there was a large push uh, on order three or four years ago to build an, a brand new Alvin. That vehicle is just completed. It's a two-phase one, so it's up to 4,000 meters now. And then the next phase will take it to 6,000 meters. I was in Astoria for uh, quite a few weeks this summer. Um, and it's going through its Navy. It's actually uh, certified by the Navy and is going through that safety certification right now. Um, it's still, uh, I've probably made over 50 dives and it's still one of the most amazing things um, I'll ever do and I, I'd drop anything to go in there. Um, so you get inside, uh, the windows, uh, as you go below about 300 feet, depending on where you are, uh, it's, there's no light penetration. They don't have any lights on on the vehicle because they want to conserve the battery power and then uh, if, you, if you put your face against the window, it's a lot of, depending on where you're in the world's ocean, there's a lot of bioluminescence. And so it's this beautiful, I'll never be an astronaut, but it reminds me if you could float through the stars, that that's what that would look like. Then once you're about oh, 300 feet off the sea floor, they turn on the lights. And us, I always still remember my very first dive because one, no one had ever been there before, but two, it was just this an amazingly beautiful landscape. And it's crystal clear, the water, uh, way offshore, there's almost no particulates in the water. So you, sometimes you forget that you're actually underwater um, because it's just so, the water's so amazingly clear. One of the analogies um, I use, so this is every five years they, on the old vehicle, they take it apart and put it completely back together again um, and do imaging and make sure that the vehicle is, uh, doesn't have any cracks or anything, which is a, a good thing. Um, but the analogy I use is uh, imagine if you were, had three people in the front of a Volkswagen bug with a flashlight and um, went up into the mountains without any map at night and wandered around and tried to figure out where you were for eight hours. And um, that's kind of what it's like. Um, but it's also cold, so uh, you might start out warm on the, you know, on the surface, but the walls of this sub are titanium, and so you get a lot of dampness and uh, CO2 builds up, and everyone's like, well, why do you do that? But it's the most incredible experience. Something happens in your brain when you're looking out, and you know there's a lot of water above you. It's, it's a really remarkable experience. So, And we try very hard, I know Craig does too, to take our students down, because it takes quite a while to figure out, since there's no visual you don't know if the turning, sub's turning right or left and if, unless you have something that you can see right out of the window, some kind of structure. So it takes a lot of time to, to get to used to diving in these subs and, and using them really well. Um, I didn't grow up uh, in an academic family at all. My dad finished eighth grade, my mom finished high school. And so even to this day, my relatives, when I tell them I'm going on a cruise, um, they think of it as a very different cruise. And so. Uh, we had a couple of digital art students that um, came out with this and they put up this time lapse. So these, um, these working ships, they're a working class ship. They're completely empty when we get on board. A lot of our cruises are about a month long. Um, this is loading the robotic vehicle, uh, Jason, which is a tethered vehicle. I'll show you some imagery of that. So basically everything from your toothpaste to the robotic vehicle gets loaded, in this case, in about five days. Uh, this is at the UW here. But this robotic vehicle, it flies away uh, all around the world, so it's, uh, it's a great tool. It, so this is, there's two, um, for the research community, for the deep sea work, the two main vehicles in the U.S. are um, this vehicle called Jason, the robotic vehicle, and then Alvin, um, which should come online in the next couple months or so. 
yeah, Seattle's a, it's a nice, nice port to come. This is a nice day, obviously. But so you can see there's a, a lot of stuff. And more and more, as we use more and more computers, uh, the complexity of the kind of data that we collect and the amount of data is growing amazingly. So this year, we came back from a cruise and had 30 terabytes of, of uh, just imagery, which is, I don't know how much, you know, it's a lot. Um, so how, how you have access to that is a, is a growing issue, but we're trying to keep up with it. So this is a really beautiful day. The kids had a sense of humor. Um, if you know the flight of the bumblebee, this is playing in the background, so. So it was, a, it was a great thing that it got a fair amount of press around for what we do. So um, as I mentioned, uh, Alvin, there's, there's some really fundamentally important things that go on when you're in the sub because you have a 3D perspective and it's the same as if you're hiking versus watching a video of hiking. So there's something different that happens in your brain and how you quantify that is hard, but there's something really different. Um, the amount of awareness is incredible when you're in the sub. But as I mentioned, so there's two things, a couple of limitations. One is that um, Alvin has to come up at four. Uh, if you drive around a lot, the dives could be only four hours long. Um, and there's only the pilot and two people. So as a geologist, if I see uh, an amazing animal and nobody's ever seen before, I may or might not know that, and I probably wouldn't know it. Um, so one of the, we're going more and more to robotic vehicles. And these vehicles are tethered. Uh, this one shown here is, is Ropos. So there's a tether. It's a fiber optic cable that comes. It might have, uh, say, 27,000 feet of cable on the deck of the ship in a big spool. And it provides all the power and all the communications to the sub. And then there's a control room set up on the ship, either as a flyaway containers, which you saw loaded, or within a like a, almost like a classroom type setting. And uh, there's many, many screens, 20, 25 screens is not unusual anymore. And what's nice about these vehicles is they have all the same functionality, so they have the same type of manipulators, but they can carry, some of them can carry up to 4,000 pounds, so we can take a lot of heavy gear back and forth. Um, but they stay down 24 seven. So they stay down as long as the operation takes, or until something starts breaking, and it's really tough working in the deep sea. So you guys know that you know stuff happens out there. So, um, but what's nice about it is that it means that we can have uh, biologists, geologists, chemists all in the same place at the same time, talking about the interdisciplinary connections that we see. And the other thing that's nice is that um, it's a great platform for students. So on all of our cruises, we take students out. We took 20 students out this year. And they work in the van at the same time we do. They are involved in the discussion. So it's a, a fabulous platform for outreaching students. And the second thing is, I'll show you in a second, is um, we can now beam all the imagery from the seafloor live. So last year, uh, this summer when we were out for 38, 48 days, um, we streamed all the video from the seafloor live onto the internet and it's accessible to anybody. So it's this great way to let people stare over our shoulders at the successes and, and um, in some of the mistakes also, which happens out there. And so in 2005, we started this streaming uh, um, program. This was the first high definition video stream. So this is at 7,000 feet on a volcano, about a 10 day steam from Axial Volcano. Um, and so people are watching this. In this case, we streamed it to Australia, to Europe, and Japan, as well as the US and Canada. Um, but they were watching this at the same time. And I think we had a million viewers in two weeks. And um, we started live feeds so people can write in and ask us questions. And uh, Jason Foundation has done this for quite a while, but this was the first high definition imagery. And I'm sure Craig could tell you more about this. Uh, we call them Dumbos because of their they're not ears, but I'll call them ears. Um, and a friend of mine, John Barrow, says that their eyes, you notice they had big eyes, which you could, might wonder about since they're at 7,000 feet. But he said they were closely related to human eyes. And I always thought that was a fascinating little tidbit. Um, one of the things that, so from 1982, uh, when we found the first black smoker off the coast here, was found just by a dredge that happened to dredge up. It's an amazing piece of rock from 1982 off our coast and from 1970 on earlier until 2000, until 2000. Um, everybody focused on the mid-ocean ridges. A lot of the National Geographic 
uh, magazines and video that you saw would be focused on these uh, unbelievable animal communities and black smokers. Um, in 2000, we were out um, working on a mountain about the size of Mount Rainier, but it was in the mid-Atlantic, about uh, five days steam from um, Bermuda, which was a horrible place to live from. Um, and we came up, we were working on this mountain, and this mountain, it was formed, it's all through faulting and uplift, so it has nothing to do with the active volcano at all. And until then, everybody, because of the connection of the black smokers to volcanoes, people that were thinking about origin life questions and about um, where to look for life on other planets had always focused on these active volcanoes, water, and hydrothermal hot springs associated with them. In 2000, we were out in the middle of the Atlantic, um, we'd finished the Alvin dive, and about midnight, a friend of mine came flying in. We'd, we used a, a dumb camera system towed behind the ship to take black and white images, and we would photo mosaic them together to try and get a big image. When you're in Alvin, you might see, you know, on that wall, you might see a very small portion of that wall, but you don't see the whole outcrop. And so we were trying to get images of these outcrops, and then we stumbled up with black and white, crummy images, this tower. And there was, we knew, she knew immediately that it wasn't a black smoker, so she came flying in, named Gretchen Frugreen and, um, from Zurich, and uh, we spent the night looking at these things. And it turned out that the first one that we found was, this is all limestone, so it's a carbonate, uh, almost 100% carbonate. Uh, this one's 90 feet tall, um, and the tallest one we found is 180 feet tall. So if you've driven over the I-5 bridge in Seattle, uh, over the Portage Bay area, it's taller than the I-5 bridge. These are massive, massive structures, and no one had never, ever even predicted them. So um, it was an amazing discovery to be involved in. We had a great team, um, and because they're limestone, we can use the same dating techniques people use to look at corals, so we know it's at least 150,000 years old, and I'm guessing, because we focused on the most active parts, that it's probably more like 200,000 years old at least. Um, and there's a I won't talk about it, but there's, it's the only place that I know of where we could date the rocks and then look at the microbes, extract DNA and look at the microbes that lived over this period. So, so this is some of the imagery. We went out there with Bob Ballard in 2005. Um, and this is some of the imagery. So this is a, looks like a stalactite or stalagmite. And it's growing on the side of this 180 foot tower. Again, it's all limestone. And you can see that um, compared to the black smokers, there is zero metals in these fluids. The pH of these fluids are not acidic. They're very, very basic. They have a pH of 11, which may not mean anything, but uh, liquid Drano is a pH of 12. So these fluids are, have properties of liquid Drano, and they're 200 degrees Fahrenheit. And within this very piece, this flange here, these are like upside down waterfalls. Um, the microbes in there were thriving under these conditions. Um, so really incredible organisms. Um, and there's no carbon dioxide. So the animals, the organisms around the vents, a lot of them use carbon dioxide. In this environment, the main uh, energy source is hydrogen and methane. So it's a whole different population of organisms. Um, and there's almost, if you use normal, um, the way most people used to use to look at DNA in these organisms, there was no genetic, no diversity at all. There was only one population which had almost never been seen before. They started using these new, newer techniques, and it turns out that the, the biodiversity here is incredibly high, but we didn't have the right techniques, or the microbiologists didn't have the right techniques to look at the diversity of organs and organisms in here. So they, they have a new, um, new term called uh, uh, operational taxonomic unit, I think. Is that right? Um, which is kind of like a species name, but not quite. Is that right, Craig? So if you look at these OTUs, there's a huge number of them, but the normal, the way that they always looked at microbes would have said that there was only one type. So again, it's one of these places where there's really, we're just at the start of this frontier of, of these, these organisms here. And to this day, uh, this is only one of these fields that we found. Um, so I'll just highlight one other discovery. In 1997, 1998, John Delaney and myself uh, we worked with the American Museum of Natural Industry and History to use an underwater chainsaw and cut off some of these large chimneys. So we recovered four chimneys that were about six feet tall. And it was to look at the mic, well, for the museum, it was an icon to look at the linkages between, you know, extreme environments and life. 
but we wanted to do it because it's been very difficult to culture organisms and a lot of the organisms don't like oxygen. And so we thought if we could get, and seawater has a lot of oxygen, we thought if we could get big enough chunks of chimney, these were still venting when we brought them up, could smell like rotten eggs as soon as they hit the surface, that we could look at these microbes inside the chimneys and, and find newer, newer microbes and get a better understanding of who was there and what they were doing. But we came back, so we, this is the chimney, and we cut it off right about there. And we came back uh, three days later, so that was the saw mark, and it, the rock had grown six feet. So there's not many places in the world where you can go and, and uh, see a rock grow. The second thing that happened was we, um, maybe a cascade volcano, I guess. Um, the second thing that's happened is we took a, one of those samples and gave it to a microbiologist. And the, so this is just off our coast here. Um, the highest temperature organism on the planet ever found was in this piece of sample here. So it lives at over 250 degrees uh, Fahrenheit. So, um, so part of the message is that one is these environments are very complex, very dynamic, and we're um, rarely there at the right place and the right time uh, to uh, they change so much that we miss a lot of the big fluxes of temperature, uh, heat, biological material, all these things that evolve over a year. And if we're really lucky, we get to go out to the same place for maybe a month, once a year. But usually there can be several, several years, if ever, that we get to go back. So John Delaney um, at um, the Dub uh, started, this is probably 15 years ago, um, started thinking about how we could have a 24-7 presence in the seafloor. And out of that grew the concept of putting uh, underwater, why does it keep doing that? Underwater cables on the seafloor with power and bandwidth. So in this case, off our coast of Pacific City, uh, Newport's right there, there's uh, 900 kilometers of cable now sitting on the seafloor. And the idea is each one of these is a big power station. It provides eight kilowatts of power, so a lot of power. And one of the big limitations in that environment before is if everything's been run off of batteries. So even if you're losing lithium batteries, having a, even a small piece of gear out there for one year, you got to go out every year. And a lot of the instruments, like a camera, you couldn't run continuously because you didn't have the power and you didn't have the capabilities to store all those data. So um, this is the largest project ever funded by the um, National Science Foundation for Oceanography. It's called, it came out of a special congressional um, uh, pot of money. They're called Major Research Equipment Construction Funds. And they are, the astronomers have been very good about getting these, these large pots of money. They're completely for construction. And it's um, therefore changing, transforming the kind of science that a community can do. So jumping from something you've never been able to do before to making hopefully very, very important discoveries. Um, this is one part of it. It's a $700 million project out of the National Science Foundation. It's a five-year construction fund. Next year is our last year for construction. And this is one part of it, um, which is the cabled part of it. So this is the base of the subduction zone. So that's about 3,000 meters right there. So 9,000 feet water depth. This is the Juan de Fuca plate. This is the volcanoes, uh, the spreading center. It's spreading across here. Here's the largest volcano. So these cables, they've been installed. Um, and at each one of these areas, we'll have many tens of sensors on the sea floor, all connected to cables, which means that we get all the data in real time. There's not less than a second delay from something 350 miles off our shore, including HD imagery, that can be beamed right in here within a second. So it's a pretty remarkable uh, project. And the other thing is there's there's many, many, many different kinds of sensors. Uh, at these sites right here with the circles, we have uh, 3,000, so 9,000 foot tall moorings that have wire crawlers on them that are instrumented. And they'll be migrating up and down through the water column, again, providing real time data. Um, some of the reason that people around here might care, um, you may or may not know that the signal to noise ratio for uh, ocean acidification off our coast is very, very high. Uh, Dick Feely, who I think you might be trying to get uh, to come speak, is um, he did some modeling that suggested that the level of carbon dioxide, the saturation level that we would see in 50 years, they saw a few years ago, 
And so there's many, many, you've all probably been involved or locally around anoxia events where there's been large die-offs. And so there's many, many reasons why we want to have not only exploration, discovery type things at vents, but also understanding what the waters are doing off our shores. So it's an incredibly large, very, very interdisciplinary um, program that will give us hopefully the kinds of data resolution from the, the micron scale, very, very, you know, less than many, many, many things, the head of a pin type scale to decade scale, and then the spatial resolution from centimeter, very small inch to, um, or the time scales from, uh, you know, a second to a decade. So it's a very, very large, ambitious program, uh, and we're, we're learning a lot about it. So there's many, there was a, um, a call from the National Science Foundation to put in proposals, um, and there's many science drivers, and this just shows from climate change, ocean acidification, uh, things like seismic activity. The, it turns out that Japan um, is putting in billions of dollars uh, to create an early warning detection system for earthquakes. And one of the applications for this uh, cable observatory in the future could be that. So if we have get to expand it, we will have some seismometers out there now. Um, but if we get to expand it and put seismometers in the right place, we depending on where the earthquakes are, we could have 10 seconds to two minutes of warning, which is a gigantic um, benefit if you can turn on power off power and get people out of buildings. So um, there's the expansion because of this large infrastructure on the seafloor with a lot of power. Uh, we'll, we'll be able to expand it and adapt to new technologies in the future. So as an example of that, um, one of the things I want to, I'll drive into since we're talking about volcanoes is axial seamount. Um, we laid 900 kilometers of cable out there. With, this is a very large telecommunications ship, um, almost 500 feet length, and it did. So we actually hired L3 Maripro, which is a large, a very large company, to install the cables. Off the coast, it's buried to about 4,500 feet water depth. We bury it uh, about six feet under the sea floor so that um, hopefully it will be, uh, people if they're fishing or something won't be able to easily dredge it up um, for safety issues. And uh, so this is what one of these power, this is a lot of information that you don't need to need necessarily, but this is what one of these junction boxes look like. On the shallow environment, they're encased in these these things weigh many, many thousands of pounds, and we put them in these trawl resistance frames. Um, and so this provides the eight, eight kilowatts of power. If you look in close, and I'll, I'll show you a slide in just a sec, these are all uh, underwater wet mateable connectors. So imagine a system where you can have, you know, a lot of power on the sea, sea floor, be able to unplug connectors and plug something in. Uh, Usually water and electrical outlets don't go very well together. So there's some really um, interesting technologies that have been developed uh, by the, mostly by the oil industry. They use the same type of thing on oil, oil platforms. So. so those are all installed now. Um, these are a close up of what these connectors look like. They're, they're pretty expensive. Uh, so now, so that, that installation, the larger cables are installed sitting on the seafloor. Um, the next part of the installation, which we just started this summer, was to install all these the smaller secondary junction boxes, and I'll show you a picture of that, that let us expand. That primary infrastructure is very expensive, so we tried to put it in safe, as safe a zones as possible, and then we use a, a series of extension cables to get it to the work sites. So we use a, a global class research ship like the Thompson. We have uh, 82 days continuous at sea next summer, so if anybody wants to come to sea, let me know. Um, it's a long time at sea. And I'm going to focus in on axial volcano now because this will be the most, although there's uh, observatories on like Mount St. Helens, uh, decade volcanoes like Mount Rainier, Hawaii, there's never been an underwater observatory on an active volcano like this. And um, I think we're going to learn a lot about it. So this is the, um, the primary cable here. There's one of those big junction boxes at the base of the volcano at about almost uh, 9,000 feet. And then there's a cable that runs up the flank of the volcano to about 45, about 5,000 feet water depth here. So we're going to focus in on this area uh, right at the top here. And again, just as a reminder, it is a very active, we picked it because it is the most active volcano on the spreading center. Uh, it's erupted twice in the last 10 years. 
and it has a lot of carbon dioxide. And the spreading center comes right through the middle. So this is where the plates are spreading apart. And it comes right through the middle of this volcano. And then there's a caldera, uh, kind of like, it's not an explosive caldera, but it's a, a valley that's about uh, a little over a mile across here. And we're, we're going to zoom into that. The other th reason we chose it is um, there's a lot of black smoker activity there. There's three main hydrothermal fields uh, up to the north and then two here. And then uh, there's many, many other areas of lower temperature to diffuse flow. So on this one volcano, it's a place where we can study the processes that are going on throughout the world's oceans but are exemplified in this one area. We'll zoom in right here. So one of the fascinating things that we hope to catch with the observatory is um, things called uh, an event called a megaflume. Um, and what you can kind of think of them like an ash cloud when something like St. Helens goes off. But in this case, you're injecting 2,000 degree, very, very hot rock into a uh, water-saturated crust, which is, uh, as a kid, we used to take marbles and put them in the oven and then throw them in cold water and watch them crack. Um, it, in this case, it's a very, uh, probably quite an explosive event. But instead of an uh, ash cloud, what we find is that there's these plumes of warm water that are ejected uh, up to about 4,000 feet above the seafloor. Um, and they're very large, 20 kilometers across. So very, very large plumes. They carry the microbes that were growing in the seafloor into these plumes. So it's one way that we can get access to these novel microbial communities that live in the seafloor is by going out and sampling these plumes. Um, and so we're hoping that the mooring on the flank of the volcano will um, capture one of those events. When we look at the, the, the main infrastructure that's going to be placed on the volcano, part of it's geophysical to look at the seismic activity, the cracking events, how magma, lava underneath the seafloor migrates around. But then there's other parts of the infrastructure to look at the fluid chemistry, uh, the, the imagery of the vents, see how the animals change over time, and to hopefully capture a seafloor eruption before, look at all the precursors during the eruption and after. So um, there's a lot of work that goes into this. You have to drive all the cable routes, figure out how many cables. The last thing you want to do is to buy you know, expensive cable and then figure out that you were about 200 feet short from the site you want to work at. So we did a lot of ro <laughs> ROV work um, to make sure that we had the cable routes. So this is a bathymetry or topography map of the seafloor. This is that wall. These walls are about 300 feet tall. Um, this is, we call this area in a caldera, this collapse zone. These are all lava channels, so these are lows, and the blue here is the lowest here. This is a, a pillow ridge, shown in green there, so that's the edge of a big lava flow. And this is the expensive piece of gear. So we tried to move it outside of the caldera where the eruptions were not as common. And then these were the cables that we were, the cable routes that we had planned out to lay the cable. So in 2000, 11, there was about a, f April, there was about a five magnitude earthquake, but there wasn't any of these, there weren't thousands of earthquakes, so we didn't think an eruption had happened. Um, but people from NOAA, uh, Bill Chadwick and others from uh, NOAA OSU came out and um, uh, they, the topography had totally changed, some of their instruments had sort of been buried. Um, and so we went, they, many people went out and remapped this, and it was a very, very large eruption. It started on April 6th, and I'll show you some evidence for that. But what I want you to show, wanted to show you here, is if you, so this is a low, like a little valley here. And then I'm going to show you, this was before the eruption, and that's after the eruption. So that is the new lava flow right there. Um, that's the hydrothermal field. This is where our, our cables were going to go. Um, we're kind of happy now because it gives us some high ground to lay the cables on, and it might be around 10 years or so before it erupts, maybe. Um, but it was, it was a spectacular eruption, and, and I'll show you some of the imagery uh, from that. So this is an outline of the lava flow. In some places, it was uh, 60 feet thick. Uh, in the toes, it was near the edges, it was... Uh, 10 meters, 10 to, so 30, 30 to 60 feet thick. In one place, they thought they found a flow that was over 100 feet thick to the south. So this was a quite a large eruption. Uh, so we're going to zoom in on ashes just for a second here. Oh, this is uh, 
So this was one of Bill Chadwick's experiments. Um, beneath, this is, you can see, it's kind of glassy here. It is glassy. Beneath that is one of his instruments. So uh, it was still actually working, though, which was pretty interesting. Um, and some of the things that happen, and the reason we're going to put pressure sensors and tilt meters out there, when a, you see the same thing on terrestrial volcanoes. Um, when a volcano's uh, getting ready to explode, because you're pushing more and more melt into the inside of the core of the volcano, the roof of the volcano will rise and the sides will tilt backwards, right? And uh, so we're hoping that we'll have, we've never made tilt measure measurements, but Bill's made pressure measurements or, or the depth change. And so this was um, before the eruption, and this was the day of the eruption shortly after, and now it's rebuilding again. And so what happened was, as the eruption happened, you released all that, all that melt that was in the seafloor, ran out onto the seafloor, and the caldera collapsed uh, about a meter or so. And uh, so these are very characteristic events, inflation events. You'll see a lot of inflation before an eruption, then the seafloor will collapse, and now it's actually ramping up quite steeply again. Uh, we, we just recovered some instruments this summer. So, so we're hoping to create, to be able to connect these inflation deflation events with the earthquakes, with the CO2 that's coming out of the seafloor, and eventually be able to predict uh, when, a, when an eruption might occur. Um, so, uh, let me see. Ah, so I want to give you a little tour because I think these things, we might need to turn the lights down just a little, but the seafloor imagery, um, so this is what one of these lava lakes looks like. Uh, it's now drained back, these big columns. You can see the drain back marks here. If you could touch that, it's all glass, glassy material. And it forms these big uh, columns. There's places where it traps a lot of seawater underneath the flow when it first comes out. And that seawater gets hot and uh, pushes itself up through the flow and create cools, chills the margins of the flow. So you get these beautiful columns. It looks kind of like a Roman, Roman ruin or something like that. Um, and they're very, very common. All those little lava channels I saw I showed you, um, those little valleys are filled with this kind of topography. So it crests over, and then the whole roof collapses, and so you can see this remnant pile of this major uh, collapse event, which we've never seen either uh, as it happened. Um, probably not a good place to be in an RV when it collapsed, but, um, but they're really, really quite beautiful features. And they're, they're characteristics of submarine eruptions when there's a lot of uh, melt lava on the seafloor. Um, the second thing I want to show you is, uh, I showed you earlier on that those images of a snowblower. And um, this is one of the reasons I'd like to be a biologist. Uh, so I'm going to show you some. This is a place, there was a large fissure system. All these collapse zones had billions of microbes just streaming out of them. And it was a, it's an incredibly beautiful uh, site. As we get into the video, we're going to start with um, a pressure experiment. So this wig head that's sitting here is the same size as this here. And um, so we put them outside the vehicle, and then as you go down to uh, 5,000 feet, you'll see that our styrofoam cups, it gets, uh, it'll, some of them get about that tall when you squish them down. So we did it, since we're streaming live and interacting with a lot of school, school kids, um, it's a good, good way to talk about pressure effects. Um, and good reason to be inside of a sub than out. Uh, so these are, this was a collapse zone, um, and all this white material is uh, biologically produced, uh, either the microbes themselves or this, it's almost like a, a snotty type material that they produce. All this yellow stuff, they first thought that they were totally confused when they first saw it there because they thought the flow, they thought they were an old crust. Old crust looks like this brown color. Those were completely covered in microbial mats. So even the new flow, had these really amazing, uh, you know, kilometer across uh, bacterial mats that formed. And uh, so we were, st we were streaming these lives, but here's a nice outline of one of these collapse zones. And they're probably endemic to many, many seafloor eruptions again, but we've just never been there at the right time. So this was the first time we were able to stream it live, and it's the, certainly the best video documentation of of any of these things. And there's one hypothesis now that maybe these uh, snowblowers act as a seed or a source 
for microbes that are more common throughout the world's oceans. Um, if you remember how many volcanoes there are, if you get these going off in very many places, they might act as a source. It turns out that many of these organisms, because there's a lot of carbon dioxide in the vent fluids, or the warm fluids that are coming up circulating, the organisms use the carbon dioxide and then they produce methane. And so the methane signature in these areas is very, very high compared to the background of water. So this is the lava flow. This is three months after the lava flow. And you can see that these animals, these are uh, filamentous bacteria, these animals are already completely colonizing these new flows. So it's a very, very rich biological area. Uh, just gonna, I have about, I think maybe 10 minutes left. Uh, we're gonna zoom into the ashes vent field. Uh, so we map this, um, I mentioned earlier that maybe 1% of the world's spreading centers have been mapped at the resolution we need. So we spent a lot of time with robotic vehicles and autonomous vehicles mapping these areas. So we have, Meter, less than one meter scale resolution, which means that um, we could, if there were you know, two or three of us standing together, we would be able to map that. Before, with a normal ship operation, you could sort of tell this building was here, but that's the kind of resolution that you have here. So each one of these is a black smoker. They're about eight feet tall. Um, and if you zoom in on them, this is a down looking mosaic. Um, this is what these things look like. So we've also photo mosaiced all the chimneys. This is about, this whole field is about the size of a football field and we took about 25,000 images and then mosaic them together. Uh, this is, uh, so that chimney, that chimney right there is down looking at it and this is the same chimney, then there's another one here. In every place you see white, it's one of the ways you can see fluid, tell fluids coming out of the sea floor even if you can't see it, is uh, these are all microbial mats that are colonizing the cracks in the, in the lava flow. So this is the infrastructure that we're um, putting down. Uh, it'll be finished next year. It's probably too small a print to read, but we'll have high definition cameras, we'll have seismometers. Uh, for those of you who might work in labs, we have a in situ mass spectrometer, which actually will be able to measure the gases coming out of the seafloor in situ. We have um, samplers that suck in the hydrothermal fluid and actually filter out the DNA, and uh, also have uh, samples co-registered that take fluids and we can be able to look at the fluid chemistry temperature and changes in microbial communities over time. So it's a, a quite a large experiment um, and it'll be all deployed by the end of next uh, summer. So we use a special robot. This one's called Ropos. Uh, it's operated by Canada. Um, and the reason it's special is it, uh, it can lay up to, the longest cable we laid was about 15,000 15, feet of cable in one, one lay. Uh, and these are these can be quite heavy, so the vehicle has a through hull lift capability and can lift about 4,000 pounds, which is a, a pretty good load. Uh, the, we streamed all the sea floor work that we were doing live, and we'll be doing it again next summer, so anybody can get on the internet and watch watch whatever we do. Uh, Laying cables, not too exciting because you're flying through the water column, but uh, when you're on the sea floor, so these are all some of the cables that uh, you can see they're quite large spools. Uh, some of them weigh over 5,000 pounds, so we have to set them on the sea floor, then go pick them up with the robotic vehicle. Um, and so this is, uh, I like this shot. This was, uh, it was a very successful cruise. This was the before picture, and we like, we like to see this. So, um, this is what one of these smaller junction boxes look like. So we, we can plug up to eight sensors into one junction box, but they can also be daisy chained, so you can add another cable and have continuous junction boxes. So it's very expandable for the future. Um, we did put down a high definition camera, uh, and I was going to show you that imagery that we streamed live, but it blew up my presentation. So I'll show you some other imagery, but um, this is exactly what you'd be able to see. So you could log on anytime uh, and you know, from 350 miles offshore, people all around the world can look at these animals. These are limpets shown here. These are um, palm worms. Uh, and, um, you know, really, we don't know how these uh, communities change over after an eruption event, if the uh, chemistry changes a lot, because we've never had enough time series in most places, uh, except for like the Gulf or EPR, East Pacific Rise, to to know a lot about these animals and how they interact with each other. So great opportunities. Um, one of the, my favorite things is um, uh, we take students out with us anywhere from freshmen 
Uh, they have to be 18, so once in a while we'll take high school kids, depending on where they are. They have to be 18 or older, um, and anywhere from, we've had music and art majors to geology, oceanography majors, and they, they work side by side with us and are a, a really great attribution to the team. They, um, so we enjoy that. Uh, these are some of the seismometers. Uh, we put them out there. We did a five-hour test where we powered up the whole system, and we measured uh, 15 earthquakes in five hours in the volcano. So it's a, it's not like we won't be seeing events happen there. And that's what's on the seafloor right now, everything in blue. Um, so we still have most of the sensors put down in some of the junction boxes, but we're getting there. So by the end of next summer, uh, everything, the entire observatory will be installed and, um, and powered up. And so the, the hope is that, if this works, um, that you can imagine a scenario where we start seeing earthquakes. This is a temperature record here. We start seeing earthquakes. It's indicating that an eruption's happening. And um, we can turn on the video. This is actual temperature data from when that eruption happened in one of the vents. Uh, this is about 700 degrees, and uh, that was in April. And by August, it had gone down to about, uh, oh, maybe not quite. 300 degrees, so a huge temperature drop, right? And so we'll be able to look at all these complex relationships in real time. And this just is an example of one of these moorings. It's a two, one, we have a two-legged mooring with a platform about 600 feet beneath the water. It has a winch profiler that goes up and down with instruments, and then we have another, this is a wire crawler that will go from 9,000 feet to almost the surface. So the, the final thing I think is, um, and it's where I want to put a lot of energy now is to the education outreach component and giving people access to data. So you can imagine having an event wall. Um, be nice to have one down in the new uh, museum outreach center that uh, the biological lab's building, uh, where you could see live earthquakes off our coast going off. And uh, if there's enough of them, it might uh, tell you that there's an earthquake going on, an eruption. And so you can imagine in classrooms at the college here, since all the data is publicly available, there's nothing restricted, that students could be in a classroom and looking at the same kind of thing that we're looking at in, in real time. Um, this is putting in a, this bin is actually boiling and so we're putting in an instrument that uh, looks at the saltiness of the fluid. Even though seawater is salty, these fluids when they start boiling put out fresh water. So we were putting in a res probe for that. Um, so we don't know all the applications yet, but what we are sure is that um, we've been thinking a lot about in third world countries where people may not have classrooms, but they might have a phone, is how we can adapt this kind of resource to educational materials where people don't have as many resources. Um, and there's also lots of a confluence of new technology coming online. So robotics in the medical industry is really large right now. Um, you've probably seen in the news that people get operated on without doctors, it's more like a machine type operation, which is still scary to me, but. Um, and then ecogenomics, how we measure microbes in the, in the ocean, um, ocean modeling. The more data that we can bring in into these complex models, we can change the models to adjust to the data that are real in real time and integrate those two data sets and the hope is to have better predictions of say when big storms what they're going to do of these anoxia events, things like that. So uh, a lot of uh, really great opportunities, I think, in the next few years. And I think uh, this is just our website. So this was last year's website. But if you ever do a search on Visions 14 for next year, uh, you're welcome to join us and uh, interact with us. So thank you very much. So first and foremost, I'd like to thank three groups. One is you, Deb, for making the trip down from Seattle. We greatly appreciate that. Uh, the folks at OIMB for co-sponsoring this. And definitely all of you for coming out. Hopefully you circle uh, November 9th. It's a Saturday, ghost forests and all kinds of cool stuff. We'll take a couple questions, and I'm sure that Deb would be willing to stick around. Sure. My question was, um, has there been any um, change in the ocean floor habitat since your um, work has started? Uh, certainly where the eruption happened, um, a lot of the 
in one area, some of the animal communities were completely covered. So where there was an active vent system, that uh, terrain is completely now under a lava flow. But what's interesting is uh, a new warm spring has started and animal have, animals have already come back. So that's, that's one big change. Yes, yeah, yeah. They, they undergo a, um, uh, you can kind of think of it as a garden where, you know, I usually get the weeds, but um, where the, depending on the time of year, the different plants will come in over a year period and evolve over time, like a, a new growth, a new forest is starting to old growth. And the same type of thing happens on the seafloor where there'll be a progression of animals that will come in first that can tolerate, in some cases, more toxic conditions. Um, and then the, the, the communities change over time, and, and Craig's definitely a world expert on that one, so. Also, please make sure to sign the sheets if you didn't. If you want to sign the head, it'll be the uh, first geology lecture series shrunken head example. <laughs> <laughs> what are the uh, currents like at that depth? Uh, currents, um, usually they're not too bad, so um, the vehicles can work quite well up to about a knot, a knot and a half. Um, where we work uh, on the volcano, it's not bad. In another place, uh, about 10 hours steam, there's a, a valley, and it'll funnel the currents, usually related to tides, quite strongly, and in some places it's hard to work. Um, but um, off of Newport, where one of our, where there's methane gas coming out of the seafloor, there we can get some pretty strong currents once in a while, and it's, uh, you have to kind of pick your time of what you're doing. Now you put <laughs> your hand up. Is this the trouble question? Yeah. Has anybody looked at the DNA on the East Coast, on the ridge, compared it to out here in West Coast? New, yes. New, new versus old? Uh, Craig, I think it's, my understanding is that the animal, it's a function in part of the age of the ocean. Is that true, Craig? Or? Oh, what? The, the differences in DNA between the animals in the Pacific versus the Atlantic? <laughs> I know for the, the microbial world, we were talking about it earlier, um, if we take a sample of a chimney that might be six feet away, uh, normally, because we don't have uh, very much time in one place, we might take one sample of a black smoker, and that you would think of that as the population for that whole vent field. But we started looking at individual chimneys, uh, um, five of them in this one field, that are anywhere from about six feet away to uh, maybe 300, 400 feet, and each chimney has its own microbial community. So. Yeah, there's a still, we have a sample, we haven't even sampled, I think, at the right resolution to ask a lot of the, answer a lot of the questions. And I'm sure that Deb would be glad to continue to answer questions. I'm gonna go throw the head out into the lobby. If you would <laughs> like to sign the soon to be shrunken head that will go with Deb uh, in the near future, uh, you're welcome to. Thank you all for coming out tonight. Look Thanks forward for to having me. Seeing you in November. <laughs>